I want to be glad when people do. Tired of being sick. Amen. I'm sick and tired of being sick. How about you, really, bud? You been sick? You're not sick, are you? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> like a child, and you'll get sick. Kiss that little baby walking out right now, and you get sick in a pencil. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. All right, Wednesday night Bible study, 6 30. We're talking about Peter. We had a great discussion, great talks Wednesday night. Looking at Peter's progression of his yes, growth amen. in Christ. That was awesome. Amen. amen. Turn your Bibles, if you would please, to 1 Samuel chapter 14. The title of this message this morning is In the Zone, message number two. Carrie and Alma, we talked about last week about being living in the zone. Living in the zone, message two. And today we're going to talk about taking the initiative. When one lives in the zone, they take initiative. And not just initiative, but it's inspired. When you live in the zone, you are inspired with initiative. Hallelujah. Initiative basically means to get up and get it going. To take the first step. The initiative. To get out of the blocks. Hallelujah. And get going into the things that God has called us unto. Now listen to this closely as I begin this morning. Listen as I read. The depth of our spiritual battles. We're going to talk about Jonathan this morning. This is probably one of my most favorite stories in all of the Bible because it's such a perfect example of inspired initiative. And I think Christian people need to remind themselves on a regular basis and <clears throat> the church as a whole, the need to have inspired initiatives. Amen. Sometimes we hold ourselves back and we're not sure if God would have us do this or say that or go there or whatever the case might be. And many times God is waiting upon us to show the initiative before He moves and blesses our lives. And, and folks, in the depth of our spiritual battles, things may not look, things may look desperate. Okay? And sometimes it does. It looks it looks desperate. Our friend yesterday, it looked desperate. And as I talked with, with Butch and Diana yesterday on the phone last evening, there was desperation in the voices that their son was nearly deathly ill. Doctors saying that if he was older and not in such good health, he possibly could have died. I have a brother that died at 26. I know many of you listening to me, you've had sons or daughters or brothers or sisters who have died early in age. And it's desperate times. Many times in our spiritual battles, the depth of those spiritual battles, things may look extremely desperate. As we look around at our lives, even today, things may look desperate. But remember this one thing, Christian people. Remember this. Things are not always as they appear. They are not always as they appear. Remember the acronym FEAR. Remember F-E-A-R, F-E-A-R, FEAR. Means false evidence appearing real. And many times in our great despair, we're, we're encompassed with fear. In our spiritual battles, and the reality is, it's not as it appears. You see, the Lord is with us. The Lord is with you. In whatever circumstance, situation, you might find yourself in. If you are in the zone, if you are living where Paul tells us to live, if we are in the zone with Jonathan, and we'll read it in a few moments, be assured that God is with us. God is with you. God is with the church. We are the church. We belong to God. Folks, I belong to God. You belong to God. And God is with us. He's on our side. Yes. At times it may appear that God is distant. It may appear. It may seem for quite some time that God is even silent. That where is the voice of God? Let us not be quick to hear the voice of God with our physical ears. 
But let us be quick to hear the voice of God in His Word. Can you say amen? For when His voice speaks, it speaks with inspiration. What we need today in the body of Christ is the voice of God that will speak His inspiring spirit. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. God is with us. We can do all things through Christ that strengthen us. And in those times, the Lord is waiting upon us to show our faith and live with inspired initiative. Take what God has given you to be you and put it to work. Take what God has given you in you to be you and show an initiative in the area of spiritual dominions. Hallelujah. Influencing others, you see. Influencing others in the goodness of God. Listen to this now, folks. Someone is waiting for us to give them such as we are. Somebody is waiting for you to give them such as you are. Somebody is waiting for us, for you, for me, to give unto them such as we are. And to get to that place, there must be inspired initiative. Somebody is waiting to be invited to church. Somebody is waiting to hear a victorious testimony. Somebody Amen. is waiting to be encouraged. Somebody is waiting for you and I to give them what God has borne in both you and I. And now before we get to Jonathan's crisis, please listen to this. You see, God uses crisis for two reasons. And the first reason He uses crisis is to reveal who we are in Christ. God uses a crisis to reveal who we are in Him. And the second reason for crisis is that God wants to show what we are or to establish what we are in Christ. To show who we are and to demonstrate what we are. Who we are requires initiative. What we are is a result of that initiative that births a witness, a testimony, a ministry, some sort, something from the Lord in us that will benefit somebody else. Jonathan was a man who could trust God with his life. And a man that knew what it meant to take action. Now let's read one of my most favorite stories in all the Bible that illustrates perfectly inspired initiative. 1 Samuel chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. One day Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man, I'm reading from the Living Bible here this morning because it's more in a story form. One day Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man bearing his armor, Come, come, let us go over to the Philistines, to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father, Saul, King Saul. Now verse 2, Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gilah under a pomegranate tree in Magron. With him were about 600 men. Now let's put some meat onto this bone. You see, here's Jonathan and his father, King Saul. They had been fighting the Philistines for some time. And now there was a lull in the fighting. Jonathan was separated from his father, Saul. Picture, if you can, with me, Jonathan just for a moment, and we perceive that he is about the same age as David. David and Jonathan became the closest of friends when David was anointed to be the next king to follow his father, Saul, and David and Jonathan became extremely close friends. So they were both young men. I would say somewhere in their mid to upper teens, possibly. In those days, you had to grow up fast. They knew how to fight. They knew how to use slingshots and weapons and swords and bow and arrows and, and spears. They knew how to fight as young men. And so here's Jonathan, alone in the fighting. He's sitting with him with his armor bearer, and he's thinking unto himself, 
sword in one hand. I've got God on my side. I can't sit here any longer and do nothing. There are uncircumcised Philistines that need to be destroyed in the name of our God, Jehovah. And if anybody can do it, I can do it. So he looks to his armor bearer and says, Oh, it is time. Let's take the fight to the enemy and cannot sit here and do nothing any longer. I cannot do nothing any longer. That is so inspiring. So inspiring that Jonathan, I got a sword in my hand. I got God on my side. And there are some enemies out there that need to be destroyed. And if me, who? And if not now, when? You see, folks, we are in a spiritual battle. We don't fight the Philistines. We fight the demons of darkness. We fight the spiritual darkness of the world. We battle the prince of the air. And our battle today is not with swords and guns and knives and spears, but our battle today is in obedience. Our battle today is in giving. Our battle today is in prayer. Our battle today is taking power and authority and dominion. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Take power and authority and dominion over the forces of darkness. People need to be healed. People need to be saved. People need to come to church. Listen, folks. People need to be in church. Amen. Now, you're in church. If you're listening to me, you're in church or you're watching. But you don't get church off the television. People need to be amongst the worshiping praises of yes. God's people and not sitting home and just listening. I'm not talking about everybody. I'm talking about those people who can be and need to be in church. Say amen. Yes, they need to be in church. They need to be around the fellowship of other brothers and sisters. They need to be in the sound of worship. They need to hear the live preaching of the gospel. They need to shake someone else's hand that has light precious faith or will give them their light precious faith. They need to feel the warm embrace of a brother or a sister. They need to be a part of the family of God. I can be a Christian without going to church. Okay, then why do we have a body of Christ? The scripture is clear. We are the body of Christ. If none of us went to church and we all could be Christians, there's no body of Christ. Body has hands and arms and legs and feet and mouth and ears. You understand what I'm saying this morning. And folks, I believe here today that the Lord would speak to us and say, somebody is just waiting for you and I to take the initiative and invite them to church. Somebody is just waiting for you and I to witness to them, to minister to them, to challenge them, to encourage them. And here Jonathan is sitting there under this tree. And he's saying to himself, I got a sword in my right hand. And I got God next to my side. There's an enemy that needs to be destroyed. Why in the world are we sitting here doing nothing? My dad is doing nothing. I can't just sit here and do nothing. I have got to be about the work of the kingdom of God. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Now let's jump to verse 4. So then on each side of the pass that Jonathan was going to have to go and fight, that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes, and on the other, Sinai. One cliff stood to the north toward Mechmash, and the other to the south toward Gila. Verse 6. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let us go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps, I just love this, perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. I just love, yeah. here Jonathan, he does not take into account his own life. You see folks, when you're living in the zone, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And that means we don't take account for the cost. Yes. 
This may cost us our life. This may bring death. We may not succeed, but we cannot sit here and do nothing any longer with a sword in one hand and God Almighty in the other hand and on our side. God can save whether it be many. God can save whether it can be few. But I will not count the cost. I will simply move by inspired initiative and God will give us the victory.